nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockheim. Hi, this is Neil Rockheim. Welcome to another edition of Killer Cross Examination. This is a podcast that I've devoted a lot of time to in an effort to help people get more informed about the legal system. And it really is my goal to help you um, get more justice in your own lives and to get more justice in the legal system, which as you see from day to day is, is not easy to do. And there are so many different personalities and approaches to practicing law, trying cases, and it's my job, it's my, I took it upon me to make it my job to try to expose you to all of the different personalities and styles, the cornucopia, if you will, of, of lawyering in our courtrooms. And I've had the pleasure to have some amazing guests and my guest this week is equally amazing. Um, she really needs no introduction, but I think she's entitled to an introduction and whatever I say is of course not gonna nearly measure up to the the lawyer and, and superstar that she is. But uh, my guest this week is Lisa Bloom. Um, Lisa began her life really uh, in um, as the, the, the heir offspring to one of America's great civil libertarians uh, and great female uh, and all over just trial lawyers, Gloria Allred, which would be hard to escape that the shadow of someone as noteworthy as Gloria Allred, but Lisa did it. She went on to advocate for, as I understand it, for animal rights, for human rights, for LGBTQ rights. Um, she, at one point, began uh, as fought, I think, for in, in, working for people who had been wrongfully convicted or wrongly accused. She is also then, she's an author. Um, I think you've written three books. Uh, and she hosted her own TV show. She hosted a TV show on Court TV, I think CNN. You name it, she's done it. And then when she was done doing that, she uh, started a law firm in her own name and they've won millions upon millions of dollars in sexual harassment cases. And it's not possible for me to describe, to name all of the, the people that Lisa has represented against the powers that be. But some of the powers that be, you'll know, um, include Bill O'Reilly, Bill Cosby, uh, I think even um, uh, Michigan Congressman uh, John Conyers, I think she's gone after the LAPD, various different police departments, and one of the th and she even as I believe ended up representing four accusers who made allegations against um, Donald Trump in in his before he was president, but allegations of sexual harassment and sexual, uh, I think sexual harassment. Um, so I I could probably could go on for an hour describing all of her great qualities, but I would rather just begin the conversation. Lisa, thanks for appearing. Thank uh, you. It's really great to have you on this podcast. And I, I sort of gave a, a very, you know, probably a, a, a pretty standard generic description of, of the, your career, but um, you have to be looked back upon your career and be extremely proud of, of where you started and how far you've come on your own. Thank you. That's very nice. Uh, you know, what can I say? I, I have my own law firm. We have about a dozen lawyers and another dozen staff members. And so I don't do it all on my own. I have a great team that works with me in every case. And to the extent that we are successful, and we often are, it's really my team that brings us those successes. And to the extent there are mistakes, those mistakes are on me. That's my approach. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Jerry, Jerry Spence had it was, that line reminded me. I'm sure your staff will be wonderfully appreciative of you owning all of the mistakes and errors. But Jerry Spence once said something similar. He said, "I never uh, my my key is to to listen to what other people say and then to copy it and claim it as my own." Um, <laughs> Right, exactly. You know, when I get all the glory, but I get all the grief. Uh, but really, I do have a great team. And one of the things I'm most proud of is is building this terrific team. Uh, just before this, we just had our weekly team Zoom. And, you know, I'm very proud of how smart and hardworking and, and passionate they are about representing victims of discrimination, harassment and abuse, because that's what we do every day. And it's hard. It's a it's a trauma about that. population that we represent. People are often very upset, sometimes suicidal. Uh, so, it, you know, our, our clients are traumatized. The other side hates our guts. 
and wants to come after us and come after me with, you know, so we have to really, everything has to be perfect. Every I has to be dotted. Every T has to be crossed or they're going to come after me. Uh, so, but you know, it's good. It keeps us on our toes. So let me, let me go back to something I asked about in the beginning. Your, your mother is, uh, is Gloria Allred. Um, and she's obviously an, an incredible, she has an incredibly impressive career and will probably go down as one of the great lawyers in the history of the United States, I think. Um, so how did you, how did you grow up at, with your mother of that stature? What was that like? And then how did you actually sort of venture out on your own and get to a point where you had built your own reputation and your own career? In other words, got out of your mother's shadow, if, if you will. Yeah. So I'm an only child. I only have one mother. She only has one child, me. This is what she's stuck with. We're only 20 years apart. She had me quite young. And really i think at this point we're more like sisters we're very close during the pandemic uh there's only one person that i have seen outside my household on a regular basis that's my mom uh outside distance being careful you know because we are we are very close when i grew up uh you know my mom didn't care about what i was wearing or you know uh, my nails or she cared about what i was thinking and what i was reading and what were the issues and was I thinking them through? You know, she always trained me to use my mind. And in those days, you know, in the seventies, when I was a teenager, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of sexism, pretty overt sexism still at the time. And so she encouraged me to stand up against it. And I did as a child, uh, for example, when I was in sixth grade, there was the faculty student softball game. Well, it was the faculty male student softball game. Girls were not allowed. I didn't think that was important because I was not a particularly good softball player, but I had a girlfriend who was, and I decided to stand up for her and fight for her and say, you know, she's a student. Why shouldn't she get to play? And I organized a little picket on behalf with all the girls. And guess what? We won. And they allowed her to play and they allowed girls to play that year and every year thereafter. And I learned something, which was, wow, you can actually stand up against injustice and you can win. It was a very exhilarating experience. And so this wasn't, it, it, me wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, a case of, you know how there'll be like the little dog will march in front and, you know, everybody starts to growl at the little dog and all of a sudden the big dog comes up behind and people back away from the little dog and the little dog thinks it's because of me, but really there's this big bulldog behind. So Which was it really I? on your own or was, was your mother sort of in the background and people were just afraid to mess with you because of well, At that time, she wasn't the big name. Okay. Starting out. So, uh, and, I, and I'm not trying to take anything away from you, but uh, I... Well, listen, I was only like 11 at the time. That's pretty good. Pretty but good to I, take on I, the entire... I, the, I, talked, I talked to her about it and I said, this is what I think I should do. And she agreed and supported me. And, you know, she didn't say don't do it. And there were a lot of little situations like that. Then she started her law practice when I was a teenager. She was a teacher for many years before she went back to law school as an adult. And... Um, you know, as I said to her, I was one time I was in a local drugstore and they had the children's toy department. And on one side, it was big sign girls toys. On the other side, big sign boys toys. On the girls toys side, of course, were all the toy vacuum cleaners. And the yeah. toy and guess which side had all the toy money, Neil? Guess. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to guess because the way you told the story, the, the guy, the boys side. Right. So I thought this is not right. And we wrote to the head of the company and we had another little picket demonstration out in front that this was sexist and they changed it. They changed it from girls toys and boys toys. So to these, are, these, are, these are fights that you had even before you graduated high school. I was, I was still a punk little kid, yes. And, but my so you got the thrill of victory. Did it, did it give you that thrill like- Yes. Was it like, was it like, uh, comparable to you playing in a sport and you got that thrill of victory or was it like <laughs> yes. satisfaction? Cause that's how I always feel like when it we win. It really is... was. And, but you know, in those days, by the way, it, you know, people were really opposed. We were like, how dare anybody suggest that there wasn't a particular group of toys for girls and toys for boys. Right. And we must be some kind of crazy radical communist, you know, th I mean, th there was a lot of pushback, right? It's amazing how far it's amazing how far we've come 
but then looking forward perspectively, it there still seems like there's a long way to go. Still a very long way to go. So I went to college, I went to law school, practice law, you know, fast forward to because you asked me how do I like get out of my mom's shadow. But did you get did, did you did you choose to be like a practicing lawyer right out of law school or did you do something else? I did. No, I did. I, you know, I, I went to Yale Law. Everybody there wanted to do clerkships. I couldn't think of anything more boring than working for a judge for a year. No offense to people who clerk, but I like, I'm not an academic person. No to editor, delete that last comment by Lisa. <laughs> I just want to be in the trenches and fight for people. I'm a very practical person. I don't want to get, you know, sucked up onto esoteric issues and the academic issues. It's, nothing could be more boring to me. So I immediately started practicing. I did civil rights work immediately. And I worked in my mom's firm after about five years. So how to get out of her shadow because yeah. that's a big issue. By the way, my daughter is an attorney in my firm now. And I think she has the same issue, only she's got two shadows to deal with. I only had one yeah. so thing that we talk about. You know, well, let me ask you because because I think that there that is a, in, in children that follow in the footsteps of their parents, particularly in the practice of law, where a lot of it is personality based. Um, I think that is an issue. And that's why I was curious because you've obviously done it. So I'm- So I, um, I, I worked, I, I out of law school, I worked for the first four years at a big law firm in New York, which is now Brian Cave. And they offered me a partnership. And I thought to myself, okay, you know, when that happened, I felt pretty good about it. Right. And, and then I looked at what my mom was doing at her firm and I thought, you know what, this is the kind of law I want to practice. I want to fight for women, I want to fight for people of color, LGBT rights. The only reason why I'm not doing it is because it's my mother and I want to be different, but like, I'm a grown up now. I'm not a child. I don't, you know, so I said, yes, mom, I will come work for you. She had always wanted me to do that. So I turned down early partnership and a lot of money and I went and worked in her firm and that was the nineties. And we did great cases. I did the first repressed memory tri trial of a, uh, a, a woman who claimed that she had been sexually abused as a child and repressed the memory and we tried it to verdict and we won and we did a lot of other great cases I represented a police officer in the Rodney King case who had spoken out against his fellow officers African-American guy found himself mopping floors and his job duties taken away we got a great outcome in that case for him uh, represented a girl suing the Boy Scouts because she just wanted to out and she didn't think that there should be Girl Scouts in so we did a lot of really interesting cases. In 2001, I was offered to play a television show on Court TV. And that was just too cool to turn down. So I went to New York. Who's your co-host? Well, it was different ones over the years, but my last one was Vinnie Politan, who's now, I just did, he's now back at Court TV in 2021. I've done his show like four times in the last two weeks. Now that we're doing the George Floyd trial. Yeah, yeah. It really takes me back because Vinnie, not have better co-host and better co-worker, just respectful, sweet. And I should add that you're actually outside. I'm so outside. So you don't have <laughs> you don't have like a virtual background of like you know. This is my I live in a. This is a podcast, but can people see this video? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. They will. I live out in the country, and it's beautiful here. So um, anyway, after court TV. And, to, and now we're at 2009. I've done it for eight years. It was fantastic. I loved it. But you know, after eight years, it's time to do something else. And I decided I was going to come back to Los Angeles, which is the city that I live in. And I was going to read some books, which I did. And I was going to start my own firm. Because as much as I love my mom, and as much as we see eye to eye on just about everything, you know, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do my own and sink or swim on my so that's what I did. It's the Bloom Firm. And, you know, we became one of the biggest civil rights law firms in the country. Do you compete with your mom for cases? You know, not really. I mean, I, I guess it's always possible now and then. But, you know, here's the, here's the reality. The kind of work that we do, there are so many people seeking lawyers. It's not like there's a shortage. Um, there, there's a shortage of lawyers doing this kind of work. And I would encourage other people if they want to do it to give it a try because there's especially sexual harassment and sexual assault, which is probably 80% of the cases that I do. There are so many people. We say tough no, cases. 95% of cases. 
They're very they, tough. They, and they, they certainly, they're tough and they're, so you've got uh, you got your work cut out for you whenever you get involved in those cases on the plaintiff side, I think, because it's. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, so how would you, when did you, when you were, what was your first case you ever tried? I mean, let me start there. Oh my gosh. Um, that would be that would have been in the 1980s. I graduated law school 86, um, and that was a, a case involving some Broadway producers. This was just a regular business litigation case because I did those two Broadway producers who were getting sued by investors because the show was a flop. And was it a jury trial? Was it a was it a bench trial? Um, yeah, I believe it was a jury trial. I'm trying to remember, but I remember that it was all about the prospectus and they, of course, had all kinds of disclaimers. You could lose all your money. And, and guess what? The investors did lose all their money because Broadway shows are very high risk investments, but they were warned and they went to it. So, jury Broadway shows are flops. So was that the case? And were those the moments where you realized that courtroom stuff and litigation was for you or did it come later on? Once you sort of got more into your, we'll just call it your your lane, the lane that you know sexual harassment, sexual discrimination type cases. Well, I I knew I always knew I was going to be a litigator, and that's what I've always been since 1986. So sorry. So um, there, there's no question about that. I find everything else that lawyers do pretty dull. Again, no offense to them. And thank God that other lawyers don't find it dull and they do it. But I couldn't sit around drafting contracts all day or doing mergers and acquisitions or something. I'd, you know, I'd rather be a dog walker. Honestly, I like walking dogs. So I seriously, I would not be able to do it. I don't have the tolerance. I'm, I like litigation. I like fighting for things that I believe in. I like getting a decision. Um, you know, I like settling cases. We settle a lot of cases pre-litigation. Sure. We know what we're doing in sexual harassment and sexual assault cases, particularly. So many of our cases you'll never even know about because they resolve so quickly. Most defense attorneys, they get a letter from me and my law firm. Uh, they call back pretty quickly and they want to resolve it. Um, that's to your credit. And that is uh, obviously a great bonus to the people that end up um, turning to you, your, your clients, to not have to be put through the crucible of a of a of litigation in a trial but yeah. um so what how would you characterize your style your courtroom style well so the most recent cases i've tried were in 2019 since the pandemic uh you know the courts have been closed and they're finally reopening and we have another trial this year and another sexual assault case coming up but the two most recent ones were in 2019 one of them we won an 11 million dollar verdict plus another million and a half in attorney's fees uh, in a sexual harassment and assault case. Uh, my courtroom style, listen, you know, I'm very aggressive on behalf of my clients. I know that I, for the most part, I have to tone it down a considerable amount in the courtroom uh, because I don't want to turn people off. I don't want to turn off the jury. I think there are times when you can really unleash if I have, for example, a sexual predator on the stand, as I did in those cases, who I've caught in lies, on cross-examination, I can really go for the jugular and confront him with his lies. And I do, and I did. And I felt like that was okay. But the rest of the time, you know, you have to be respectful of the witnesses. I mean, if it's just that most witnesses, I think, are doing their best to tell the truth, they might be making some mistakes. And if you really lay into them, I don't think a jury is going to like it. So well, so th that that brings to uh, some that brings to point something that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so you know, I've had the gamut of lawyers on the show so far talking about very different personalities. Uh, Jeff Lickman talked about how he just from the moment, if you know Jeff, from the moment that the, the case starts, he just wants to be suffocating, and he's very much like a seems like a bare knuckle brawler. Um, Effley Bailey was on, uh, and he actually, even though he's, he looks and sounds more like you know, the uh, Marine and kind of like a pugnacious guy, he is describes his style much more like kind of waiting for the moment to strike and then striking. Um, I have I have some very very uh, good friends. One of my one of my oldest friends as a lawyer um, was a prosecutor at the same time as me. And she was is an awesome trial lawyer and is, is always aggressive. 
But I know that she felt that there were times where she felt like I would be labeled, I described it to you, that I would be labeled being aggressive and assertive as a big, hairy chested, you know, like aggressive, macho, assertive guy. And if she did the exact same thing, she would be described as bitchy. Yeah. That double standard. Yeah. Um, have you encountered that? And if you have, like, I, I presume you have, what do you do about it? Well, sure. You know, I'm a female in this world. And so, of course, I have. And it's still a very sexist world. And there are definitely double standards. So I also think, though, that it is in everybody's interest as a communicator in any context to have variety. If you're always at this level being really loud and really not, okay, eventually people get kind of turned off. Yeah. There are times when you need to speak softly and slowly and pause and make your point. Other times you want to raise, right? You want to raise the volume. You want to change the pitch and the speed. And that's especially true in front of a jury because being on a jury is mostly very boring. And, you know, no one's going to be falling asleep when I'm doing an examination. Okay. That's one thing. It's like, that's good. That's good okay? to know. So I, that is not going to happen. So whether it's me, you know, dropping a book loudly if necessary, or hopefully more importantly, you know, doing something that's very interesting, putting up graphics, looking right at the jury a lot, you know, making people simple as if they know you're actually looking right at them. They, right, you know, right. Paying more attention, right? So I think it's important to, have, to your question. Women, we have, there is a double standard. What we look like is much more important to people than what men look like you know god forbid my lipstick is too dark or too light or my shoes offend somebody i mean everything with women is going to be judged so i i dress very conservatively i you know jewelry hair makeup everything very conservative god forbid a woman doesn't wear makeup then we're not authoritative or we're just we look like we're sick or something right i mean this is there's actually studies about this right so, but I think for the most part, honestly, I just try to be very authentic with people. I think I, you know, I'm imperfect. I can guarantee that in the course of a trial, I'm going to make some mistake because I'm a human and I like to just own up to it and apologize. I, I, one of the things I remember from one of my trials in 2019 was I started asking a question and then I said, you know what? Uh, I object to that question. It's too... <laughs> And the judge said sustained. <laughs> and, you know, I thought that was very funny. And the jury all got a big laugh. I was like, you know. You That's funny. I, I, I actually have, a, a, in a case I tried with multiple lawyers, I objected once. And one of my mentors was trying, he was in the trial as well, representing somebody else. And he goes, no, he doesn't. <laughs> That's right. He goes, no, right. he doesn't. So right. um, do you... So I, I want to talk to you about some of your cases, but do juries know you? Do they know who you are when you start these trials? Um, they recognize you from CNN or from them do. or I TV. Mean, How do you deal with that? You no, know, it's funny. So, I, well, I, you know, I always just start out by introducing my client and uh, their attorney from my firm, myself, uh, you know, do any of you know my client or my other co-counsel or me? And, you know, a lot of them raise their hand they say they know me and then of course the defense I, I thought this was terrible on their part because they then took the ball and ran with it on when it was their time to do voir dire lisa bloom they said is a very famous trial attorney she's on cnn she's i'm like why are they building me up <laughs> right do any of you know her are you sure and then a few who hadn't previously they start raising their hand a little oh yeah well now that you mention it yeah i do you know well do you have views of her and then you know, mostly is positive. I mean, of course, if you're right, but if it's negative, you know, then you're they're identifying the people for you know. that you may need to I mean, to most of them would say, yeah, she's, you know, she seems to be very passionate about her cases. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. So I didn't think that was very helpful for the defense, but it actually helps you. Because one of the things that I think lawyers make mistakes about in jury selection is that they attempt to select jurors as opposed to identifying jurors that have a bias against so if they're actually asking people to think about you and to right. reveal an opinion, or maybe they didn't have an opinion that they had really come to, but they had a feeling. And now these defense lawyers want them to look at you and 
and think about that feeling. And then yeah. they tell you, yeah, I really don't like her actually. Fine. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. I, I don't attempt to please everyone. That's a losing battle. So they have so, me goodbye. And you've, rep you've represented enough well-known people that there's a chance that some of the jurors will, will know some of your clients. Yeah. And then of course, when you're, when you're kind of out there in the public eye, then there's also people think I've done a lot of things that I never did that somehow they just come up, you know, you did that. No, that, that wasn't. Like what? Give me the, like what? Stormy Daniels. I'm like, no, I, no, I didn't. I don't know. You don't look like, like, you don't Stormy look like Michael Daniels Avenatti. Like or whether they think I look like Michael Avenatti, which would be a strange person to confuse yeah. me with, but. That person would, that'd be the, that'd be the witness in my cousin Vinny that needed the hundred yards and the new pair of glasses. I mean, that guy's so not, not that Michael's not a good looking guy, but you guys look nothing alike. He's so. bald. So let's yeah. start there. Right. <laughs> so, so have they, have jurors ever brought up to you during jury selection, anything about any of the cases that you've handled good or bad? No, it's not that specific. And, um, you know, honestly, I I don't really want to talk about myself that much in front of a jury. So, right, right. But I really want to talk about the case, and I ask them a lot about the Me Too movement and the sexual harassment case because that's a good way of getting their attitudes without asking about the specific facts of my case. What do you think about Me Too? And and when I would say, how many people have heard of the Me Too movement? You know, almost everybody in the pool raises their hand. How many of you have a positive view of it? Almost everybody raises their hand. Okay, that's good. I'm okay. I'll take this. I'll take this pool. No further questions. Right? So, so, so expand on that for me. When they, when you ask them that question and they say, that's good, mm -hmm. or they, they approve of it. Do you go further with those jurors? Or do you commonly leave them alone and go to the ones that didn't I, raise their hand? I do. Listen, here in California, uh, the rule for jury selection is we get, I forget what the specific language is, but something like we get like lengthy and probing questions. We get to ask a lot of questions. So I'm going to take advantage of that because, you know, and I know in other jurisdictions, judges will cut you off and they'll give you 15 minutes or something. Here we get a lot of time and I want to know, you know, we've been litigating this case for four years. We finally have our jury trial. Like I'm going to take advantage of this time to talk to the potential jurors, right? So I'll ask them, they, have they ever accused somebody of sexual harassment? Do they know somebody who's accused? I'll tell you, I've learned something, which is my worst jurors as a plaintiff sexual harassment lawyer are mothers of sons because they feel that could be their son wrongly accused. And my best jurors are fathers of daughters. <laughs> because they want to kind of ride in and protect the princess. So it's a lot of people think I would want female, I wouldn't want male, but that's not the case. And uh, there, of course, there's always going to be, there's women who say during jury selection, you know, I'm, I'm very feminist. I worked for the UN Council on Women. One of them said, I thought, well, she's gone. I, of course, the defense is going to strike her. I don't even have to take any more time talking to her. Right. And sh sure enough, immediately she's gone. So, you know, you end up with the extremes getting weeded out and you get the people in the middle. And I want people in the middle who, who have daughters or if for women, older women, because you know, we have a saying in the women's movement, the older women get, the more radicalized we get because we have more sexist experiences. You might think when you're 22, well, I've never had any sexist experiences. You know, by the time you're in your 50s or 60s, it's almost guaranteed you've been a victim of sexual harassment, sexual assault, wage disparity, whatever. So that's who I, that's who I want. And I, of course, I want leaders. I want the people on my side to be leaders so that the people in the middle will just come along with them. Do you use um, do you use jury consultants and handwriting analysts, or are you more old school and give them questions and just kind of and and work through the the voir dire process and, and figure it out? Yeah, I... I can't hear you. Uh, so listen, we always represent the underdog, people who are like minimum wage workers, they don't have a lot of money. So we don't have the budget, frankly, for jury selection, uh, jury, jury consultants or anything like that. But I really mean it when I say listening, I ask open ended questions, I try to keep my questions short, I try to and I say to them at the beginning of jury selection, I really want you to talk to me. 
I know this is uncomfortable. You're in with all these strangers in this weird setting. And now I'm asking you to talk to me. But, you know, my client has been waiting four years for this trial. And we want to hear from you. So I thank you. be offended everybody has different attitudes that's fine and I get them to open up and I of course I'm listening very carefully to them but everybody on my team my client my paralegal my co-counsel everybody is to be listening watching looking at the, are they fidgeting what are they reading or are they as you know juror number 17 nodding while juror number two is talking we got to be so tuned into them um, I think the art of listening is a lost art, especially with lawyers. We like to talk, but you know, you got two ears, one mouth. You should be listening twice as much as you talk. Larry King said, I never learned anything when I was talking. And that's something I really take to heart. I think those are great tips. That's <laughs> something that, no, they are. They are great. They're so, it's so easy to say. And it's so, unfortunately, it seems so seldomly used. I see so many lawyers in court cross-examining witnesses. Some are at the podium writing things down. I'm like, what are you writing down? Like you're this is it. This is your this is the masters. You're on the 6T. There's no time to be, you know, like goofing with your grip. Like this is what are you writing down? Or they'll be taking notes and have their head buried in the and they don't realize the witness is looking around the room furtively or looking, they just miss so much. Yes. So in that, in that, in that vein, do you, how would you kind of just tell us about your preparation? Are you, uh, are you, I don't get the sense that you're sort of a fly by the seat of your pants person. Um, but do you use outlines? Do you use notes? Do you take notes up there with you or do you do it kind of all, you know, off the top of your head and maybe a combination of all, of all but I'd like to hear it. I over prepare. I've been that way my whole life. You know, when I and I say to kids in school, how do you get to grow up to be me or, you know, to be a lawyer, to be a professional, whatever, you're going to do the homework, you're going to do the extra credit, and then you're going to do your own research just because you're interested in it. That's what I did. Also, kids don't do drugs, don't get pregnant, don't get someone pregnant. Okay. Putting that aside, in terms that's that's the key to success, really. As a teenager. those last the last ones. Okay. <laughs> as a teenager, well, that's what derails a lot of teenagers. So I just I know. Don't do those I, things. Do the homework. Do the extra credit. Do your own research. Don't drop out of school. You'll you'll be fine. So in terms of practicing, listen. When I'm going into a trial, I, I'm going to read the whole file multiple times. I'm going to, you know, talk to the client over and over again until the whole case. I'm going to do all the research. That's just how I am. I'm an over-preparer. I want to know more about the case than anybody, and definitely more than the other lawyer does. They never do as much preparation as I do. So they'll say, you know, they'll ask questions, and I'll just, you know, what's the operative complaint? It's the Second Amendment complaint. Like, how do they not know that? You're in trial, right? Right, so right. Any little thing I want to know. I want to remember what every witness says. So we have a lot of outlines of depositions and things like that. I can refer to it very quickly. For So for witness examinations, I, of course, I do have an outline, um, but it's really, I don't have to write out each question because I'm beyond that. When I was a baby lawyer, I did, but I, it's just topics. And it's, um, you know, like if there's a deposition site, I'm going to have all the deposition language there. So I know what to ask them to trip them up. And hopefully they'll say something different from their deposition, which very often happens. And then I can crucify them with their prior and consistent statement, if that's the kind of witness I want to do that with. If it's a friendly witness, you know, I'm going to lead them along and be friendly and helpful and gently correct them if they make a mistake. Something that you, you said, you, you talked about your clients generally being, I think, minimum wage workers, the underdog. Um, tell me how you go about representing those, I mean, that, that group of people, but then going into the court and being able to get jurors to give you, like, I know you won an $11 million verdict. You got a seven figure victory against the LAPD. I know you've had other million dollar verdicts and people can go to your website. I think it's the, is it the bloomfirm.com and they can see all of your, not all, but a lot of the verdicts. Tra tell people how you go from that to, to that and get jurors to do it. Well, 
I love juries. I'd rather be in front of a jury and talk to current lawyers, judges, sorry, judges, you know, any day of the week because juries are just regular people who I think have a lot of common sense. And I think lawyers and judges may spin off onto these details and loopholes and fine print and just give me a jury. And let me explain the case to the jury in plain English. They're going to be with me. You know, I, I only take probably 2% of the cases that come to me. So I have the, you know, good fortune to be able to just take cases that are really good cases. Give me good facts. That's all I care about. Okay. But have you heard jurors tell you that they're not, they don't, they don't like the idea of large judgments or large settle, large, or, or are your cases you sort of, because of the, the, the type of injustice that's done to the clients you represent, that really isn't a, a factor. Well, there's always going to be jurors who feel that way, but you, listen, I have also have the benefit of practicing in California, which is very pro employees. So for example, in the $11 million case that we're talking about, we have, you know, if they, they have to go through this jury, was she sexually harassed? Yes. Did she complain? Yes. Was she retaliated? Yes. Okay. Turn the page. Now we're going to talk about damages. Show them not only her lost income, but her emotional distress damages. So her lost income, if she's a minimum wage worker, I think that one is a little better than minimum wage. She was about $50,000 a year. Okay. That's minimal uh, in terms of damage. If we get those damages, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars projected out a few years. But what we really get is the emotional distress damages. I have a psychologist testify that she suffers from PTSD because her boss sexually assaulted her three times, grabbed her genitals in the workplace. That's post-traumatic stress. PTSD is incurable. So let's talk about her lifespan. She's got a projected lifespan of another 42 years. She's got 42 years of a psychological condition, PTSD. Let's break it down by year. How much per year you want to give? I forget what numbers I put up for that. And it is incurable. It is something that you can control, but it's ne it never goes away. So that that's how we got to $3 million on compensatory damages. And then we get $8 million on punitives. We have this guy who has done this before. His company kept him. How dare they? You have to send a message. Once I get to punitives, I get to talk to them about sending a message. You get to be righteous about, about yes. making, a, making a difference. And I'll tell you, I have a case we just filed against Guess, the clothing company, and Paul Marciano. And I have had previous cases against them that settled non-confidentially. And this guy is still at it. He's still sexually assaulting models. And I'm telling the other side, uh, this is going to be the best punitive damages case I ever had because you have known about this guy for many years. You can, they actually got rid of him for a period because of so many women complained. Then they brought him back. Then he allegedly sexually assaulted my client. I mean, I can't wait to try that case. You just give me, just give me any 12 people. It's, that's a huge, huge case. How dare Sounds they? Like How dare so, they? To, so when you've had people like him or others, powerful executives or others on the stand, or I presume that they've called expert witnesses to try to rebut some of the, your, your expert witnesses claims. Tell me a couple of stories like memorable moments where you've had a witness on the witness stand and they've just been salivating and have actually gotten, gotten uh, you know, your, your teeth into them. Well, you know, that last case that we were just talking about, they actually didn't have expert witnesses. I know that they thought they could just cross examine mine and mine held up pretty well. But the salivating was over the defendant himself. His guy's name is Uncle David. He's a billionaire. And he's been accused by multiple women of sexual assault. And he just keeps at it. So uh, he was very arrogant in his deposition. And we had all of that. And we had it on video. We had it queued up with sound bites. And I, you know, I just laid into him. And I think the jury found it very entertaining. But I also saw myself as kind of the voice of the community that someone's holding him to account when nobody else ever has. He was born a billionaire. He's still a billionaire. He's just never had anybody call him did, out. Did he, did he treat you respectfully or did he treat no. you? He screamed and yelled at me. He got up out of the witness stand, started to approach my client. Wow. My counselor and I put ourselves between the client. I said, don't you get near her. Don't you touch her. I was, you know, there's no bailiffs in the courtrooms here anymore in California. So they had to 
safety, security as well. Um, but you know, that's just the mama bear in me. That's no, I get that. But happening. so how did you, were you aggressive with it? Were you in, were you in yeah. his, in his face from the start or did you? No, I, mean, I was not literally in his face. Cause oh, I, I know, but you know what I mean? Were you... but yes, I was very aggressive from the beginning because he had admitted some things too. Like he admitted, Oh, they had a stripper in the workplace. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the stripper in the workplace. Let's talk about the pornography that had nothing to do with the workplace that he wanted everybody to see, which was extremely graphic, disgusting pornography. And, you know, when I'm it's like a dog with a bone, when I have something like that, that he's kind of admitted to, like, we're going to go nanosecond by nanosecond. I can't spend too much time on the pornography. You put it on her computer, you stood behind her, where were your hands? hands and then you pulled it up on the screen and you are, you, are you watching the jurors do you have people watching the jurors throughout this so that you can see their reaction and how they're reacting yes absolutely right so i think one of the things that a lot of lawyers are not good at is the sense of timing that when you have a good point you want to slow it down you want to stay on that point you want to get that into their minds and then if there's another point you need to hit but it's not great you hit it and you move on right so he he would say, you know, can we move on from this point? I and love it when a witness does as that. As long love as it. I'm asking a different factual question, I can keep going. How long was it up on that computer? What was displayed on her computer? Who was there? What did they see? These are all different questions, so I get to keep going. Uh, but you know, he was losing it. He was seriously losing it. So this is a, a good transition for me to ask. So you you have been involved. In, in, in various ways and some of, in, in going after some of the country's most recognizable names and personalities. Um, and I mentioned that you had, you represented uh, accusers of Donald Trump. And I also mentioned that you represented an accuser of John Connors. And I did that on purpose because you, it wasn't like you picked a, a political affiliation to side with, you just went after after both. So what's that like? For example, you went, you represented, I know, someone in against Bill Cosby, right? This is James Dickinson, absolutely. And what was that experience like going up against Bill Cosby? So it was tough. That was four years of litigation. We ended up getting a great win. So what happened was back, I think it was back in 2015, a lot of women started coming out and accusing Bill Cosby. And one of them was Janice Dickinson, who is a big supermodel, a famous person. I saw her on CNN talking about her experience of being drug drugged and raped by Bill Cosby. And then I saw that his attorney did a uh, press statement calling her a liar. And I thought, aha, her sexual assault claim may be time barred, but now she's got a defamation claim, which is which she can assert. So I... Uh, I, I actually went on CNN that was, and, and I said that exactly that, that I thought she now had a claim and I would love to talk to her. I didn't know her. And so then the universe brought Janice to me. I guess somebody saw it and they told her and she came to me and I said, look, let's go. And, but of course, like with any case, we do a lot of our homework. We vetted her. We went over the story. We checked it out. She had, who did you talk to at the time? Who did you talk to in the 80s, 90s? Who did you talk to before any other woman came out against Bill Cosby? And we got those people to sign sworn declarations before we even filed the case, which is what I typically do. It's one of my little tricks so that witnesses can't change on me later because now I have a sworn statement from them. And we filed the defamation case. We went uh, up and down. They, they went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court on pretrial motions. And uh, ultimately, we were able to settle that case for a very substantial sum, which I'm not allowed to say. No, no, it's, I, I get it. It was a very substantial sum. But, you know, kudos to Janice, who was very strong. And she testified in his criminal case as one of the prior bad acts witnesses. And I went out there with her, prepared her. She testified beautifully. And... Um, you know, those women who all stood together to take him down and to put him in prison where he belongs and where he is to this day, uh, they are truly heroines. And you've also got, you've also represented, I think, three women who made allegations against Bill O'Reilly. Yes. So Bill O'Reilly, it was 2017. Uh, I have Did you guys know each other? Did you know him from the television days? 
So back in the early 2000s, I was sometimes a guest on his show as a legal analyst talking about stuff. And then the first woman in the early 2000s accused him, Andrea Magnus, filed a lawsuit. So I did a bunch of television shows like in North America. And I said, I reviewed her complaint. And if she can prove these facts, yes, she states a good case for sexual harassment. Then Fox News came out and called me an inexperienced hack who only got where I was because of my mother. And I didn't know what I was talking about. And I said, well, that's interesting because I've been an expert legal analyst on your air, including on the Will O'Reilly show many times. <laughs> but that's how they operated. So cut to many years later, I found out that my friend, that the New York Times wanted her to go on the record so they could put out a story with her and a lot of other women who were too scared to go on the record. You gotta get in their face. And she said, I don't think I should do it, Lisa. What do you think? I said, Wendy, you know, she, she and I are really We don't do this kind of thing. Who's going to do it? You can't expect a woman in their 20s to do it. So, Wendy, we're going to take him down. I said, and she's like, you, that's impossible. You know, he's the number one cable TV. I'm like, you do what I say, follow along. We're taking him down. I, I know how to do it. We're going to do it. By the way, it's the same thing with Paul Chris Healing right now. He's going to go down. Mark my words. Because I'm not going to rest until he does. He's done this too many times. So back to Bill O'Reilly. We a conference because you got to get it in the news. But then you got to keep it in the news. You can't just let it be a one-day story. That's what the defense wants. you got to keep it in the news by having new information every couple days, drip, drip, dripping. And you want to bring out other accusers. But a serial predator like him, I knew that there would be more. And sure enough, there were. And I announced to the Murdochs, uh, I'm going to release a book for free. He's the only one. This is way overdue. We already knew about six at that point. I got three more, and I took them through the Fox internal system with the hotline, and we recorded them. And anyway, within three weeks, he was gone, at, as he should be gone. And then he sued a guy for defamation who had stood up for the women. I represented that guy, and we won that case. Amazing. So, not like me. <laughs> uh, I, it sounds like he doesn't like you very, very much. So, so if he has a show, you're not going to be a guest. So let's. I'm not right. on his Christmas card list, you know. <laughs> so who would you, if there was somebody that you could have in the witness chair, anybody, who would you choose it to be? Anybody. You mean to cross-examine? To cross-examine. A direct examination is the. I mean, anybody can direct examine. You just well, actually there is an art form to direct examine. I know, but as you know, because you got to fade into the kind of into the podium and let the witness shine, right? With non-leading questions, it's not so easy to do non-leading questions when you're trying to get somewhere, and you're telepathically trying to tell the witness what you're looking for, but she's <laughs> pepper, right? But you can't quite, you know, you yeah, that's right. The whole thing. But I know. Uh, right now, right now, Paul Marciano. So he's the one you would like to have most the most. Well, it sounds like you'll probably get an opportunity to cross-examine. It seems like. Right. So right now they're moving to compel arbitration in our case, because of course, you know, that's what employers are still doing to sexual harassment and sexual assault accusers, even though under California law, it's supposed to be banned now, but there's a federal law, the federal arbitration act, which supersedes. And so people are still being forced into arbitration which for those who don't know is, you know, a private confidential proceeding, private judges, no jury. So if that's where I, you know, we're opposing it, I think we should win, but even if she doesn't get her day in court and we're forced into arbitration, we'll fight them there. You know, we'll fight them wherever we have to fight them. There's just been too many women over too long. And this big company, which claims it stands for women's empowerment, guess it's a women's brand. And they have kept this guy after all these years and they allow him unfettered access to models who continuously accuse him of sexual assault. And, you know, my current client is, was suicidal. She literally almost took her own life. I mean, it, it's horrific. So that's, that's the one. All right. So tell me what's, um, what's ahead for you. Do you have uh, any TV shows coming up? Any books? Uh, do you have your own podcast you're doing? Do you have ways for people to hear more from you? Or are you just focused on your individual caseload and, and, and going from there? So I, I don't, I'm not hosting any shows or podcasts. I'm full-time practicing law. It's, it's more than a full-time job, you know, leading my team of 
dozen lawyers and, uh, you know, all my clients and cases. And that's, that's really what I enjoy is just fighting for my clients and being a guest on a show like yours. This is very kind of you. I'm, I'm a guest on a lot of TV shows all the time. Uh, people can follow me on Twitter if they want Lisa Bloom or on Instagram, Lisa Bloom esque, where I post a lot about what I'm doing for fun. I do a lot of hiking and backpacking. I'm going to do a week backpacking on the Pacific Crest Trail very soon. I've been doing a lot of camping and, and backpacking during the pandemic, which has been my salvation during these tough times. So being outside, nature, getting dirty, that's what I like to do to stay, stay sane. So just moving forward, where do you see the next big battle? Like what's the next big area? Like I think LGBTQ rights and the the fight that um, trans and um, gay and lesbians have in the workplace and in society is there's a side there's a portion of society that's just not making room for those for that group of people in yep. my view yep. and there's a lot of pushback with we see laws being passed in parts of the country that are just you know, they're, they're so cruel. Yes. Um, so like, that's an area that, that, that I see people like you and in your particular field seen as, as the next area that. Right. So we've actually done a lot of LGBT cases and specifically about trans folks. We had a big case that resolved recently that we won recently on behalf of four trans women who are victims of a hate crime at a bar. And we thought the bar should have done more to protect them. The bar actually kicked out the bad guy, which was good, and then kicked out my clients who were victims. We thought that was wrong. Um, we oh, because it was wrong. There's nothing to think about it. I mean, wait, what's to think about it? Everybody has to go. Like, it wasn't an alternative. My, my, they were my, their presence is so... Right. Is, just alone causes such distress that they need to go to, it's ridiculous. Yes, and we represented a trans woman at a big company who was often misgendered by her boss, meaning he would call her a him instead of a her. And she was very upset and she would report it, you know, this is a big deal to trans people, you gotta use the correct gender. I mean, just like if I use the wrong gender with you, you wouldn't take kindly to that. So. We not only won that case and got her a very significant settlement, but we got the company to agree to do a massive retraining of everybody in the company about trans issues. Because I do think a lot of it is about education and awareness and making people aware and understanding a little better. Uh, we also have a lot of Black Lives Matter cases. We have three cases arising out of peaceful protesters at last May's Black Lives Matter protests who were uh, victims of police rubber bullets, two shot in the face, one shot in the genitals. Uh, just, you know, you're out there protesting police brutality. Mm -hmm. I know and the protest well. I, brutality, I right? thought it was proving their point. Very important. So, so I think these cases are very important. I'm, I, you know, I'm following the George Floyd trial right now very closely and doing some. And you're commenting on that for Court TV currently? Yes, yes. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think the prosecution's going to get a conviction. I don't know about top charges, but I would think at least manslaughter. And I think that's that's very important. And I think that's the right verdict if that's what the jury comes to. Oh, um, I appreciate that. Let me, let me leave with this just so I can make sure people know how to find you. You're an important lawyer and I think an important person for people to be able to, whose opinion matters. So law firm is, is at the bloomfirm.com, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, your Twitter account is Lisa Bloom is at Lisa Bloom. Yes. Your Instagram account is at was Lisa Bloom ESQ, which are people who don't know is short for Esquire, which is because you're a lawyer, right? Oh, yep. Okay. Anywhere else anybody should be looking for you besides maybe buying your your books on Amazon or Yeah, that's it. I mean, my website is the best way to reach me through the contact page if you have a, a case that you want us to consider. Uh, that's the best way. And we do get back to people very quickly, almost always within 24 hours and often a lot faster than that because we understand by the time somebody reaches out to me, they're probably pretty upset and kind of desperate and they really want to know if they have a case. So sure. we get back to people very quickly. That's important. I, and I, I know that's important to 
alleviate that anxiety on the part of the people that are calling you. So this is, I really appreciate you appearing on my podcast. Um, means a lot to, to me and um, people who want to know our podcast can be found on YouTube. It can be found on Apple, Google, Spotify. It's on www.killercrossexamination.com. Um, we're easy to find. You can go to the website. You can find the episode. You'll see Lisa's episode soon. You'll see her and I talking on YouTube. If you like it, hit like, subscribe, comment. Um, I'm certainly interested in feedback. And of course, if you've got something that you think Lisa should know about, you know exactly how to, to reach her. I've gone over it a couple of times. And because this is a podcast, you can actually rewind, <laughs> not commercial. <laughs> you can actually hear the, the, the law firm website, Twitter account, and, uh, and all that again. So, all right. I, again, Lisa, I really, really appreciate you coming on. Um, and it's great to have you. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. You've been very kind. Podcast. Have a great day. The nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockheim.